Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The clock on the wall apparently is out of order because uh, Director Weber, Dr. Weber, has informed me that according to the Atomic Watch, we have just seconds to go. So I'm going to welcome you to the monthly meeting of the OPB Board of Directors. Please call the roll, Madam Secretary. Barrett. Here. Kavanaugh. Here. Gay. Here. Green. Here. McGuire. Here. Mines. Here. Ulrich. Here. Weber. Here. Item number two, announcement regarding public notice of meeting. Notice of the time and place of this meeting publicized by notifying the area by publicizing the same in the Omaha World Herald and outlets by displaying such notice on the arcade level of Energy Plaza since August 9th, 2013 and by mailing such notice to each of the district's directors on that same date. A copy of the proposed agenda for this meeting has been maintained on a current basis and is readily available for public inspection in the office of the district's corporate secretary. Additionally, a copy of the Open Meetings Law is available for inspection in the public meeting book located in this meeting room. Item number three, review of the June 2013 Comprehensive Financial and Operating Reports and approval of the minutes in the excused absence of Director Kavanaugh for the last meeting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry for all this distraction with my mic. Eric? Uh, yes. Kavanaugh? Uh, pass. Green? Gay? Yes. Green? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Mines? Yes. Ulrich? Yes. Weber? Yes. Motion carried. Item number four, persons wishing to address the Board of Directors on a particular item are asked to approach the microphone as that agenda item is discussed. Comments will be heard following board discussion of the item and prior to a vote by the board. Persons wishing to address the board on all other matters will have, have an opportunity before the close of the meeting. Item number five, resolution number 5967. Now therefore be it resolved by the board of directors of the Omaha Public Power District as follows, that the engineer certification requesting that the board waive the sealed bid requirements in accordance with Nebraska revised statute section 70-637 as amended is hereby approved that the district is hereby authorized to negotiate and enter into a contract for welding services required to replace or modify selected portions of room 13 socket welded pipe and valve to review and approval of the final contract documents by the district's general counsel and that the notice required by Nebraska revised statute section 70-637 as amended shall be published in the Omaha World Herald. <coughs> So moved. Second. Director McGuire. Was this planned? I'll try not to get around. I think so. I'm not going to let him touch anything. <laughs> okay, to continue. Uh, uh, as part of the high, letter, high energy line uh, inspection program, it's uh, been identified uh, that we had previously had, uh, we had a technical basis for excluding the high energy line breaks in room 13 of uh, the auxiliary building, which is outside of containment. Uh, it's been uh, decided that this is not correct and uh, these lines do need to be inspected. Uh, the uh, lines are uh, original to the plant and the difficulty with this is that they have socket welds and that the type of ins ins inspection that is required is a volumetric inspection uh, with radiographic volumetric inspection. So to do this, we have to have butt welds um, to be able to inspect the lines in the future. So as a result of this, we need to re um, place, go on to um, discuss this with different people, figure out the best uh, vendor for this. and. Uh, replace the uh, existing socket welds and most likely also all the pipes. Uh, it is uh, outside of the uh, normal work force of our people, so we're going to uh, the, the bring out special field machining and welding capabilities are needed, as well as uh, <coughs> radiography services. And uh, so compliance with uh, sealed bidding provisions uh, is going to be impractical and not the best interest uh, of the public for the public. The estimated uh, contract amount is $697,000. So what we're asking here today is approval uh, by the board of the engineer's certificate to authorize management to negotiate and enter into the contract 
for welding services required to replace or modify the selected portions in room 13 of the socket welded pipe and valves at Fort Calhoun. Very good. Any board members have any comments or questions about this project? Just got a question. How, how long will this take, or when's the expected timeline to do it? <laughs> Yeah, it, it will fit under the existing schedule of tornado missile protection work that we're doing right now. So uh, we'll, it, we've done some work with uh, some of the companies that have done some of the other piping replacements for us. So it's in the, in the, in the I'll say, in the nature of a, a couple of weeks to get it done. And then to waive the fitting requirements, I know we don't like to do that, but sometimes you have to do that. So, but there are, this has been done at other places before. It's not like... Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah, the type of welding services that are provided by... Um, you know, by the companies that do this is, is I'll say, fairly normal or routine in the nuclear industry, certainly. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from board members? Any from the public? Seeing none, please call the roll. Barrett? Yes. Kavanaugh? Yes. Gay? Yes. Green? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Mines? Yes. Ulrich? <coughs> Weber? Yes. Motion carried. Item number six. Resolution number 5968. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Directors of the Omaha Public Power District that the regular meeting of the Board of Directors in September shall be changed from September 12, 2013 to September 19, 2013 at the district's offices at Energy Plaza, Omaha, Nebraska, and that the revised board meeting schedule for 2013, as outlined on Exhibit A attached hereto, is hereby approved. Motion and a second, please. So moved. Second. Director Barris. Uh, there was a, uh, this is a change from uh, previously, the schedule was September 12, 2013, and the meeting is going to be moved uh, to September 19, 2013. Uh, this is uh, due to, there's a high level meeting uh, with, which is going to be held in Omaha. Um, on on the week of September 12th, uh, that President Gary Gates is going to attend in his, uh, an, an industry insurance meeting. Are there any questions from the board member? I think we might have to um, introduce your family though before they leave for. Okay, I will. Before they leave for. Uh, because it's an evening meeting, and uh, I just want to introduce my children. Um, I have three daughters and a beautiful wife, Sally, uh, <laughs> Stella. Will of Fortune. Oh, yeah. Come on down. Uh, Stella, Ruth Ann, and Elsa Barrett, and my wife, Sally. I didn't think that the discussion was going to be very serious. So I think I'll bring my neighbors down on the 19th. <laughs> you can take me on to introduce them. Any, uh, any comments from the public about this issue? Seeing them, please call the roll. Barrett? Yes. Kavanaugh? Yes. Gay? Yes. Green? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Mines? Yes. Ulrich? Yes. Weber? Yes. Motion carried. <clears throat> Item number seven, resolution number 5969. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Directors of the Omaha Public Power District that the proposal of Midwest Underground, Inc. in the amount of $926,372 for the procurement of labor and material to install foundations and deadline <coughs> for substation number 6815 is the lowest and best bid received at request for proposal number 4050 and is hereby accepted. So moved. Second. Whoever, please. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, this, uh, the purpose of this item is to install some substation uh, structure foundations, transformer foundations with an oil containment system, and cable duct line necessary to support the construction of this substation 6815. This uh, new substation will provide electric service to the Belleville, Bellevue area off the Air Force Base and the new Stratcom building. All the work is uh, being constructed on Offutt property under the utility privatization agreement. Three proposals were received. All of them are legally and technically responsive. The engineer's estimate for this project 
for $700,000. We're asking for authorization by the board to award the contract to Midwest Underground Incorporated in the amount of $926,372 for procurement of labor and material to install the substation foundations and the duct line. That's the item. <laughs> and we need your approval. Yes. Any questions from board members or comments? I think we already discussed that it was higher because of the... Uh, the work rules. The work, the work rules and... Yeah. And the access on the to get onto the base. Yeah. Any uh, comments or questions from the public? Nine. Call the roll, please. Sarah. Yes. Kavanaugh. Yes. Gay. Yes. Green. Yes. McGuire. Yes. Hines. Yes. Ulrich. Yes. Yes. Motion carried. Next up is the uh, OBPD mid-year status report. Usually at this time, President Gates delivers us kind of a monthly update, but uh, this is going to be kind of our mid-year <laughs> report. And I would invite any board members to do a PowerPoint that would like you to go out and sit in the seats in front of us so we can view it. Not that we haven't already seen it. Thanks, Chairman Ulrich. I'll uh, go ahead and get started here. Uh, the format that we're going to do for the mid-year update, and as Chairman Ulrich said, it's new. Uh, typically, we give a monthly report. This will be a summation of the first six months, some of which you've heard before, um, some of this new information, but it's a compilation. And following my report on the overall company progress and what we're doing, our CFO, Edward Eastern, will give a, a mid-year financial update. Our strategic plan, which we briefed in here before, has a vision of being a fully engaged organization that achieves competitive rates while maintaining financial stability and high satisfaction. Key to that is our mission, which is to provide affordable, reliable, and environmentally sensitive energy services to our customers. So it's a balance of all three of those items, affordable, reliable, and environmentally sensitive. I'm going to talk a little bit about people, process, and plants as I go through this briefing. First is taking care of our customers. One of the biggest responsibilities we have is to return service if there is an outage. Outages are, are utility, uh, happen to utilities from time to time, primarily due to weather. We had a good example of that June 24th when we had an unexpected storm that resulted in damaged power lines. At that point, we had 52,000 customers out. It was restored very quickly and professionally, as all our men and women typically do for us. But that is an example of many of the restorations that we did in the first six months of the year. Also, high customer satisfaction. You're going to hear following the mid-year report from the J.D. Power and Associates individuals here. And once again, we did get first place in 2013 in the electric utility residential customer satisfaction. That's 13 years consecutively. Customer care is a big part of our mission and our vision. One of the areas we have implemented to do that is a new phone system. We replaced the current system with a voice over internet protocol known as VoIP. Its capability is to route 800,000 plus calls per year to an IVR or to reps. Preferably, we get them to reps. It improves performance reporting capabilities and ability to route calls, faxes, emails, chat contact to reps so we can get information quickly out to the customers. And it does provide a foundation for future changes going forward so we can improve our customer communication in all aspects. Community outreach is a focus for our company. Many of our men and women that work here volunteer in many, many organizations. I want to highlight a few of the efforts. The Heartland Walk for Warmth and Run for Fun raised $132,000. Last year, it was $114,000, so we saw a big increase there. We also obtained a $15,000 match for QA. The use of this money is to provide assistance to people that need help paying their bills as they go through life, and it's been a great project for us going forward. Also, energy-saving trees. We distributed 2,000 trees. We believe that's a great part of the future, and we did that in four days. Had a great participation there. The 15th annual power drive. This is an incredible experience uh, for the students that get to participate in it. 
you have a chance to see it, it happens. The finals are in Omaha every May. It's sponsored by OPPD and NPPD and a couple other organizations. The individuals that go through this power drive, and this is our 15th, learn about efficiency and conservation. It's all about electric vehicles. We provide the basic battery and motor, and they design the vehicle, and they have a competition. It's not based on speed. It's based on efficiency and length of time they can be in service. <coughs> Some of the graduates of this program, it's been in 15 years, have now chosen to go through school in engineering or other technical professions, and they're out contributing to the community. And we actually have alumni coming back to this event, helping show the students what their future is going forward. We also host local high school students in many, many areas. We just did one at Fort Calhoun in math and science, and that has proven to be very useful going forward. I'd like to take just a quick advertisement. Uh, we're partnering with the unions in Omaha to have a, a walk and a run on Saturday, September 1st. All the profits from this will go to the Energy Assistance Fund to help some folks that may need a little boost from time to time uh, through their energy bills. Touching on the financial, and Edward Easterlin is going to go into a lot of details. With regard to our rating agencies, and we have two, Moody's and Standard and Poor's, the long-term debt ratings are AA1 with a negative outlook from Moody's and AA stable from Standard & Poor's. OPPD's bond ratings remain among the highest in the utility business. It's as high as you can get with Moody's. You can't get any higher, and also with Standard & Poor's. So those bond ratings are indicative of a very well-run utility, and we're proud to have those. Standard & Poor's recently met uh, within the last month and reaffirmed our rating. Uh, so we'll look forward to, to the future there. The Stakeholder Initiative. I believe many in this room will be interested in this. It's the initiative we put together to hear from customers about what's important to our utility and to provide input on all facets of our business, whatever decisions we're going to be making going forward. We conducted workshops across the service territory. We hosted open houses. Customers were invited to participate in an online survey. We briefed the board on the structure of our stakeholder process at the Tuesday committee meetings, and we plan on taking this to the board in September for a vote of approval so that we can use that in the future as we go forward. Sustainability, when I mentioned the three legs, affordable, reliable, and environmentally sensitive, sustainability is a huge part of our future direction. We're at, uh, by 2014, 15% of our energy sales will be renewables. That surpassed our goal of 10% by 2020. It's important to note also that this is a voluntary goal. This isn't a requirement. We're doing this by choice. We believe it's the right thing to do. We're getting that 15% by a 200 megawatt addition through the new Prairie Breeze Wind Farm, which we anticipate will be online in January of 2014. We also have green power programs, 5,600 participants in that, and that accounts for 16,000 megawatt hours annually. Key to the sustainability and key to using less energy going forward is our AC management program. It installs load control devices on air conditioning to help during peak times. Surpassing the goals we have, we're on track to having 21,500 participants by year end. And those 21,500 units are capable of shedding 32.2 megawatts of peak summer load. To put this in perspective, uh, for some of our smaller units, that's pretty close to 80% of their capacity. The key part here is by doing these load shaving techniques, we don't need to add new generation going forward. We limit the cost of going forward as well as adding any new generation. So it's worked out well for us. Of course, key to our business is getting the electricity from the generating stations to the people that are going to use it, all our customers, and also being able to provide Nebraska a way to get power out of the state, both from a wind generation point of view and others. To support that, we're participating in a 180-mile high-voltage transmission line that connects, connects our Nebraska City uh, substation to the new Kansas City Power and Light Maryville substation. 45 miles of that line will be in Nebraska. It will be paid for through a community effort through the Southwest Power Pool. Our part of that is going to be about $65 million. That part will be re-contributed re, uh, re to us over time from the Southwest Power Pool. This will allow us to stabilize our grid as well as provide export and import of power if we need it uh, through our power system. We also support growth and economic growth. You heard about one today that the board just approved, which was for a new substation. We've done many of those in the last six months, located in Sarpy County in Richardson County, and also support a specific new businesses that are coming to our area, particularly Fidelity Investments. We're also working with Offutt Air Force Base. You may have read about the new STRATCOM headquarters. We're providing a new substation and many uh, improvements in the electrical distribution down there to support that economic growth. 
Our power stations have run extremely well um, in the fossil unit area, and I'm going to cover that. OPPD is environmentally responsible. Our plants are in compliance with all the environmental permits, plans, and programs on the local, state, and national level. We constantly monitor whatever our emissions are, and we use that not only by ourselves, but independent regulators do that as well. Our Nebraska City Station set a new record for monthly high generation, 93.6% capacity, and it surpassed 300 days of continuous operation. Our North Omaha Station is compliant with all air, waste, and water regulatory permits, and right now we're currently evaluating the operations and the options for North Omaha Station and what its future will be. That's a decision that currently we're studying, and we'll do that in a thoughtful, measured way on what the future of North Omaha will be. <laughs> North Omaha Station was recently recognized as the winner of the Powder River Basin Users Group Small Plant of the Year. This is an achievement that doesn't indicate how much you use, but how you use the product and how you use it in a very environmental way. That was a national competition, and North Omaha won that national competition. And on June 27th, we hosted representatives that presented that award. Fort Calhoun Station uh, has changed status since the last time that we visited with the board. The uh, reactor fuel has been reloaded into the reactor at this point, and we're in the reassembly portion of that, uh, of that phase where we'll reassemble the internals of the vessel, reactor closure head, and uh, prepare to pressurize the unit in uh, preparation for startup. With regard with our regulatory interface with the NRC, there are 36 areas that the NRC is inspecting in their checklist. 11 are or will be closed in the near future. 22 are still being in inspected with a substantial progress in all of those. We had a public meeting on July 24th, which indicated positive progress toward restart. We had several visits from the NRC and, and by the leadership of the NRC, the NRC commissioners. On May 2nd, we had Bill Magwood here, and on May 22nd, Bill Ostendorf visited the site. And today, we had the new regional administrator, Mark Dupa, visit uh, Fort Calhoun Station and that was a very positive visit as well. I had a chance to personally visit with him, and uh, he noted all the progress made at the station. As I indicated, we have reloaded the fuel in the reactor, which is the first step in preparation for operation. We did get a license amendment approved on July 27th to uh, approve our design basis for the new tornado missile protection, and on July 29th we completed that reload. We're currently repairing the upper grade structure lift rig, but we need to use that to reassemble the rest of the reactor at this time. So now I'll have Edward Easterlin uh, come up and give a more detailed financial presentation on where we're at. Thank you, President Gates, and good evening. Um, I'd like to start, first of all, by looking at our electric revenues uh, for, for calendar year 2013. I'll point out just a little bit on the format so you can follow along as, as I discuss this. The first column there, 2013 year and forecast, is really what we call a six by six, six months of actual and six months of projected data. That's then compared to the second column, which is the 2013 budget, and this budget was reviewed and approved by the board in, in uh, December of 2012. The third column is the variance, that's the difference between where we think we're gonna land at the end of the year and what our budget predicted. The last column is where we landed in a variance uh, at the year, excuse me, at June. Um, highlights on here, uh, total projected revenue is a, is a billion 82 uh, million. The budget was 1.1 billion. Uh, variance there is 21 million uh, to, the, to, the, to the negative, meaning we have less revenue coming in than we had forecasted. The contributors to that are primarily uh, the debt retirement account, uh, 12 million there. That's being driven by having 12 million less in that account than we projected when the budget was developed. And then all system sales being 34 million under budget. Uh, that's a result of, of having less energy available to sell in the off system market. One other item I will point out on this slide, the 25.4 million. This is a tariff item that's on the, on the retail bills. It, it, it adjusts the bill for the amount of fuel or energy and the cost of that energy above, above what's caught, uh, excuse me, included in base rates. Turning to expense, uh, fuel and purchase power, total 
$297 million forecasted for the end of the year compared to a budget of 302, uh, an underrun there of 5.1 million. Looking categorical, categorically through this, fossil uh, looks like a $19.7 million uh, favorable variance, uh, nuclear 18.1. Uh, the nuclear is a, is a result of the delayed restart, uh, the assumption in the budget uh, versus the third quarter uh, restart. Wind purchase uh, power, uh, $1.7 million variance there, and other purchase power, 31. The increase in the other purchase power is to make up for the reduced generation on, within our fleet. Looking at non-fuel O&M, uh, nuclear production, uh, the budget uh, is, is 194.2 and our forecast is 194.2 and I'm going to go in a little more detail on that on the next slide. Uh, fossil and the remaining uh, functional areas are projected to come in on budget for the year with the exception of administrative and general and there we're looking at $11 million favorable variance. That's a result of reduced benefits uh, that were implemented uh, at the beginning of this year. Looking specifically at nuclear, uh, core operations are projected uh, to exceed the budget by $24.1 million. Restart recovery expenses are also projected to exceed, but at a total of 47.3. And then we transfer, uh, for transparency purposes, we're showing the total cost here, uh, but from an accounting standpoint, th that cost is then transferred out of O&M into a regulatory account. It's called a deferred asset, and then we then amortize that expense over a 10-year period. So you can see the expense there going in, and you can see the expense coming out. It has no effect on the bottom line, but it does go in and out. The other items are restart and recovery amortization. This is where we take that regulatory account that I mentioned, and we amortize it or spread it over a 10-year period. The variance there is a result of the budget assumed restart for Fort Calhoun and the projected third quarter restart. We don't amortize the expense until the, place, the station completes its outage and resumes operations. The outage accrual, the last item there, uh, $15.8 million favorable variance. This is very similar. We take the outage associated with the refueling and we accrue for it 18 months prior to that outage. We don't start the accrual process until we end the current outage. And since we're in the outage, we haven't started accruing the expense. So in total, you can see the bottom line there is zero. Now, if you take the 24.1 million unfavorable variance, Compared to the 8.3 and the 15.8, those, those items exactly offset each other. That's just coincidence. On the 0350 O&M expenditure side, in September of 2012, we estimated our expenses uh, for this particular item, this regulatory item that I mentioned just a moment ago, at $143 million. The expense in 2012 was forecast at 113 and 2013 at $30 million. As we've gone through this process, we actually incurred $69.8 million in 2012, and some of the forecasted expenses that we had in 12 actually rolled into 2013. And so in 2013, we're exceeding that amount, but in total, we're still coming in under the project estimate. Looking at the capital side, uh, we're projecting to be about $20.6 million over on uh, nuclear production. This is a result of uh, discovery items that occurred after the budget was prepared and the other categories are projected to remain on budget. <laughs> on the 0350 capital, uh, this is where we had the discovery items. The original estimate was $21 million in 2012. We actually spent 20.1, slightly under the forecast. In 2013, we did not estimate this in the budget because we didn't know what was going to come out of discovery. That's where we incur the current variance. In total, we project $52.2 million in capital. Debt service coverage is projected at 2.0 times coverage. Uh, this probably doesn't mean a lot to most of you, but it indicates how much flexibility we have in our, in our financial structure. In other words, what's our strength for you? What would be how many times can you pay all your household expenses and still pay your mortgage? So this is a very important calculation for our investors. And the rating agency, they want to make sure that we're, we're, we're very solvent, and this says that we are. If we go all the way back and look at the first slide that we, we talked about, uh, we had a $12 million uh, deficiency in debt retirement account, and we had off-system sales. That totals $16 million, so we have a revenue deficiency. 
we're, we're trying to offset that revenue decision deficiency by reducing expenditures. We have the 11 million that we identified earlier in the administrative and general category, and we're looking for an additional 11 million throughout the organization to make up that differential. <clears throat> so the takeaways are we have a revenue shortfall due to reduced off-system sales and also debt retirement uh, fund transfers. We are uh, pursuing budget reductions to mitigate this revenue shortfall, and to the extent we're able to do that, we'll be able to main our, maintain our financial position. We'll also be able to maintain our financial metrics. Uh, additional rate increase is, is not anticipated uh, the remainder of the year. Thanks, Edward. Uh, Chairman Ulrich, that can, concludes the mid-year report. And uh, I think the men and women of OPPD have done a great job maintaining utility, maintaining the reliability, uh, the affordability piece, and environmentally sensitive. And it's a more detailed report than we normally give, uh, but we wanted to try this and see if this helped uh, give a status of the utility. Thank you very much. Before the directors stay comfortable, we're now done. Uh, are you done yeah. here? I'm going to introduce Mr. Chris Elderly, Senior Director of JD Power. Uh, I think uh, we'll be pleased to hear what he has to say to us. Chris, he also has a PowerPoint, that's why I'm asking you to stay here. Welcome, Chris. Don't touch the mic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, rip it out as tradition holds here. Um, so, anyway, a pleasure to be addressing OPBD and its customers today again because uh, J.D. Power takes a lot of pride in uh, the amount of research we do because we think it's positive research. It's re research that attracts customer satisfaction. It's one that uh, allows co companies to understand what the bar is, what is high for customer satisfaction, how can customers be satisfied, and how you can satisfy your customers more importantly. Um, it allows for um, utilities to go in and take a look and say, you know, where can we score better? What can we do better? And the common characteristic of those who score high is they're constantly looking to be better, to conduct something um, that, uh, and engage in activities that customers want to hear about and want to know about in a way that's very satisfying. So with that, uh, we conduct two studies um, in the utility segment, the business electric study and the residential electric customer satisfaction study. I'm going to go over a few of the highlights of the residential customer satisfaction study and then uh, um, make a claim that I think OPPD will be very um, happy with. It's a response from its customers. What we do is we purchase a sample. In other words, we ask uh, OPPD customers, aside from OPPD and every other utility, all, all 126 that we rank there, um, <laughs> to give us honest feedback, third-party feedback, uh, um, the blind feedback, if you will, because we'll never tell the utility exactly who's responding. Give us some honest feedback on exactly um, how they're performing on a, a variety of different factors. Power quality reliability, keeping the power on. Restoring power in a timely manner. You know, of, of course, avoiding lengthy outages, but also handling outages, giving the type of information that's very satisfying to customers. Of price, offering not just a good price point, um, but a bill, man uh, bill amount that's manageable, a ways to help customers manage their bills to even greater degree, and, and then offering the options and, and other kinds of uh, value-added features uh, that help customers understand price, afford price, and manage through it. Billing and payment, providing options, how do you pay your bill, providing a format, a bill, and access to billing that, that, that customers can easily get a hold of, easily understand their bill, and then, understand, and then try to get to the information around that bill. So trying to add, add some, um, some, a lot of value added in that way. And then corporate citizenship. What, is a, what does a utility do to be a, a productive and, and goodwill ambassador to its community? How can it support the community, the local causes? How does, it, how does its people volunteer in the community? Every utility I go to, this is one thing I'm very proud of in the utilities, we being part of the utility zone, because every utility I go to, I think pretty much leads the market in terms of having employees more than any other company volunteering in the community. Very active in the community. I think that's a fantastic uh, uh, st stand that the utilities have, and I think it's one that they're, that they're, that they're rewarded from. It equals about 13% of overall satisfaction, as a matter of fact, as you can see. Communications. Are you not just providing communications, because some communicate, not all communications are great. The communications you have to have that uh, score high, information, right? 
informing customers how to interact, how to um, pay their bill, letting them know about the options you have, letting them know about um, the way that you can be environmental, what uh, Gary just went over, a lot of that, is, as well as um, what you do for the community and then how you can actually offer those options and, get, and, and go through it. And then, of course, there's customer service. Customer service looks like 6%, right? It doesn't look important. When someone has customer service, they call or they have service in some way, that equals 19 to 20% of satisfaction. Okay, it's very important. And they're probably calling about, you know, I'm going to make sure I hit the right button. I did. A power quality liability issue, a price issue, a billing and payment issue, right? If you talk to your customers, if they call you, it probably falls within one of those three areas. So it's very important to have high customer service, and it shows the dedication. Um, to me, if you want to look at one factor that shows dedication to customers and relating to customers and helping them with their problems, customer service is it. So when I look at that and I, and I see uh, uh, some scoring that, that we have, we also pair back to say, just some what are the brand attributes. What do customers think before they even rate the experience or the engagement? What do they think about the company as a whole? Uh, there's two that really stand out for OPPD, scoring really high if you compare yourself to the industry and in, in Midwest uh, mid-size ranking category that we'll get to that we rank you in, um, but also in terms of environmental concerns a little bit higher as well. But look at the ones that, that are the highest. Customer focus. We ask customers are they more bottom line focused or customer focused. They're more likely to say customer focused. The higher the score, the better. Bottom line um, versus customer focus. Friendly versus uh, rude as you can see, and then good reputation, just the overall, above five, the industry's at 4.7 on a rating, 4.8 for the West, uh, for, for the Midwest midsize, a little bit better than the industry, and then of course 5.2 for OPPD. This shows you that the people are connecting, and, and, and the brand is connected with the people, and they're, and they're permanently interlocked there, and I think that's uh, indicative of a high scoring utility, knowing that the utility and the people of the utility are there working for the community. Industry satisfaction were, were as opposed to the highest ever. One thing that's going on is the, um, in, if you want to rate better, you've got to improve more than the improvers. The industry is continually focusing on improving its customer satisfaction, improving the ways it does business in a way that's more electronic, more convenient, adds more value, provides more options. These are things that utilities are grappling with every day. Uh, Power core liability, uh, rating about as, as well as it did in 2011. But look at price, price going up. Here's the interesting thing about price. Price across the country is going up. Price per kilowatt hour is actually increasing. However, a lot of what the efforts that, you, that uh, citizens are taking on their own measure is to lower their consumption themselves. And some of the um, utilities are also leading that, helping them, giving them the conservation tips and the DSM. So consumption is actually going down. But they're also providing layers of service, layers of options. That's increasing the value concept around price. Billing and payment um, is high, like I said, as options come out. Corporate citizenship is also uh, starting to grow within the industry as well. And like I said, that's the dedication to the local community, the dedication to the environment, the dedication to the energy efficiency and other kinds of programs that customers want to know about. And the, and the one that I want to really end on here for the industry is 706. First time the industry has been above 700 on customer service. Serving customers, that's the core principle. That's what it should be the core principle of, of all utilities and all companies in our eyes. Uh, so if I look at that and then I compare OPBD, a little bit of a downward trend here, right? So coming off an extreme, extreme high here for a little while. However, power power liability, um, you know, stable to last year uh, with price taking a little, little bit of a dip. So there's two things here that uh, are looking at. How well do you score? If you look at 577 versus still much higher than the industry, right? Who scores now at 551. Um, but customers are asking for um, those extra value things. And I know that uh, the OPPD management is focused on how do we increase this experience? How do we make sure that we have what's in place to help customers with their bills, help them make sure it's affordable and, and work on that service? Billing and payment um, having an equal. Uh, Corporate citizenship, if I'll go back to the industry again, 578, the highest point ever. Corporate citizenship, over 600, has been over 600 um, since 2011, 12, and 13 in recent memory. Uh, communications, one of the things that, that leads there is how do you get out to customers? How do you communicate? Customers want communications. As a matter of fact, in, in, in our research, we find that most customers, over half of customers, would like to have more communications from their utility. They want to know what you're doing to help them, how they can lower their bill, what you're doing for the environment, 
um, the you know, energy savings kinds of offerings. I want to know about the kinds of products and services you have, the things you've built, and the great things you um, and the great things you do in the community. They want to know about that, and that's something that uh, is at a core. And, you, and uh, OPBD has always done extremely well on five eight five eighty five for the industry, six twelve uh, for OPBD. And then here's the big one. The one that you're always one of the top, towards the top of um, all of the entire industry on customer service. Your call center reps do a fantastic job. Your call center is one of the best in the industry. You should be very proud of it. Um, hopefully the CSRs are getting pizza every day for the kind of work that they do um, in your call center because I can tell you they do a fantastic job. 750 all the time. I mean, look at this. Finally broke above 700 in the industry, and you've been up there for a long time. Okay, the call center is, is, is there and it's really a strong and it can, it's one of the ways that OPPD connects people to its customer base and adds that value. So as we go through that, we look at each one of those factors, we weight it by those d d different weightings, we ask all those questions, we then come to um, an overall score. And that overall score is 673 that you saw. Um, it rates you, again, ranks you at the highest of the Midwest mid-size category. Uh, congratulations, by the way, on that. Uh, you're, you're starting to make it look easy. From 2001 to now, 13 years straight, you have uh, won this award on the Residential Customer Satisfaction Index. There's a lot done it for you. I've talked to Kentucky Utilities, WPS, Apaco, LG&E. They're all saying, we, we, we're going to get there. So there's a lot of people looking at you, learning what you do, learning, um, f taking notice of that, and, and discovering best practices on their own to, tr to try to get there. But you can see a very competitive um, market there with um, you know, five really top utilities all, all you know, above average in the Midwest midsize. So 673, I want to congratulate you on that. I want to say congratulations about that. Um, more on that with some metal later on. But, you know, if I look at what, what you do and I break it down, I find power, you know, power quality, reliability, getting the power, serving the power to customers, keeping the lights on, and working with them while, while power is out is a strength of, of OPBD, as well as that total <coughs> cost of your electric service. Go back to the brand attributes. One of the brand attributes we're also having is affordable. Total monthly cost of service is one of the reasons why, um, and the satisfaction, the ability to manage that bill. So power quality liability, building and payment power and, and uh, price, really high, scoring really well, and giving you an advantage to the Midwest, the others in the Midwest midsize, as you can see with all the green bars. Um, in terms of a peer set gap, right towards the top of, of all of them, um, there's Mid American there, two points above, you know, Mid American, and really posting, doing that by posting solid scores across the board. Doing that by posting really great um, scoring on power quality, liability, price, building and payment, corporate citizenship, communications, customer service. And you can see customer service by far um, the leader on that customer service score. Again, that's really the strength of, of OPBD. It's the people and the people that's, that serve um, you from, from uh, in your call center. Power restored within an estimated time. We talked about that. You know, it, the, one of the key things and challenges that utilities have is getting the power and the message out. One of the things to look at, and I know that you're working on, is the um, um, providing power within the estimated uh, time of, re of restoration within the estimated time. 79%, almost 80% accurate. There you go. I mean, uh, this is something you all, lot of util all utilities try to do extremely well, and you're right on in there with all that. <coughs> a source of outage information, a lot of different sources are being used for outage information. You're giving them a lot of different channels to do that with. Percentage of customers that receive a callback, letting customers know you know, that your power is back on. This is one of the initiatives that, that hopefully you're working on, and I think that that'll be much more welcome ongoing. Midwest Midsize, you know, familiar with, with energy savings programs. There's a lot of DSM players here, Louisville Gas Electric, Vectrum. A lot, you know, by DSM, I say, you know, offering those rebate programs, um, um, looking at rate base, taking some out, and then offering um, customers some rewards in terms of being able to purchase um, appliances and, and other high energy efficiency um, appliances so that you can, um, so, so that obviously they can lower their bill and they can manage your bill down lower. Now, if you look at that, you have 41% because of, of the energy efficiency, but what this mask is a really great performance on energy conservation tips. 
providing the tips, providing the energy conservation, providing the kind of information that customers can use on their own to help weatherize and, and lower their consumption. Uh, and you can see the, the, the difference. This is something that's really great to, to get there on because 66 points higher satisfaction whenever there's an energy efficiency um, program awareness in place. So you know, th th that, that's what you want to continue to do is raise the needle on that. You already have total monthly costs really high. It would be great to also continue to add value to that through uh, this, uh, the, this continued uh, conversation around energy efficiency. Uh, in terms of rate increases, you know, um, customers obviously have some pushback on, on when there is a rate increase. One of the ways to battle that is by continuing at some trends of adding value. Again, the energy efficiency was one. Um, moving customers into payment channels that are a little more alternative, a little bit more innovative in ways they want to pay, not just by mail, but by utility website. You're one of the leaders on having customers online paying online at your utility website, and extremely satisfying when they do. Much more satisfying than when they pay by mail. Extremely more satisfying when they pay by mail on your on your website. So doing the right thing by them, that's how you're adding value. Another way you're adding value is getting out to the community. Uh, you know, I talked about dedication to the community, people being the cornerstone of OPPD. Another thing that's out there that's a cornerstone uh, is look at the environmental awareness. Whenever customers are aware, this is one of the things they want to do. There, there are more, about 80 points more satisfied when they're aware of what you do around the environment. That's why you're hearing so much focus on what are we doing around environment, around renewables, around energy efficiency. Local donations and support. They, uh, the, the, the efforts on that are very appreciated. Employee volunteering, connecting those people out there, um, very satisfying as well. And then, of course, safety and dedication to lo local community. These are big things. These are what customers want to know. And then when I look at it and, and I consider um, you know, where you are on, uh, on these different initiatives, I say, hey, 683, 694, 660, 734, all right there. And in terms of getting out and talking to and, and talking to the market on it, these percentages are those who actually recall it, right right in there with that peer set, that aggressive peer set in terms of awareness of local donation support, awareness of the employees volunteering, and the dedication <coughs> to the community. Recall the utility. We talked about communications. I'll start ending here because this is the, the this is something about is that recalling the utility communications 690 versus 654. This is where. You, this is what you bring. When you talk to customers, 26 points, um, um, or actually 36 points more satisfied when they are because you're talking about the high impact um, topics that they want to know about. The environmental programs, energy, say how they can save money in their bill, uh, their uh, safety, uh, and you know the power core liability, what you're doing to support the system, all right there. Um, this is the recall and communications that customer recalling that shows you a positive hum. You're getting out, you're getting in front of it. Very good recall, cutting 61% of your customers recalling a communication from OPPD. And then again, wh what are you discussing with them? Things about what you're doing to, um, to, to, to invest in the system from smart to reliability, electric system improvements, very satisfying. Those are the types of things you're talking about. Environmental, renewable, that environmental bent. Um, saving money with, with some sort of energy, um, saving times of types of programs. All these are things that are rate really high here, and that's why you get such a great communication score at the same time. <laughs> Talking to customers not just about anything, but about things they want to hear and things that they need to know. And then um, lastly, as you're looking at customer service, called only. This is the peer set, 695 when they call your, your call center, 738 for you, right? A huge, huge difference, very significant. Called and then went online too. So you're calling um, um, when they call 749 and when they go online, it, it doubles up, it even adds more value. So your call center and your web service all creating a lot more value for, for, for customers. And this has been a very consistent, <coughs> a huge consistent um, a performance by OPPD. This is something I think you should, the, the hallmark of corporate citizenship, the hallmark of communicating important topics that customers need to know, the hallmark of helping customers with their bills, and the hallmark of having um, a, a great you know, reps and people in your call center serving your customers every day is something that uh, you should be very proud of. And they do that with great metrics, including, and I put the arrow here, first call resolution, 84%. I think that's like the third or fourth highest in the entire industry of 126 in terms of first call resolution. <laughs> nice job, nice work. 
So with that, I'll, I'll ask if there's any questions. But more importantly, I want to uh, pr proudly provide an award, a J.D. Power Award, um, to, don't be shy. I don't know who's going to say it. But let me just say that because I'll let you know, this isn't just an easy award. This is one where customers get very critical. This is one where customers are have the right to say what they feel and rate you in a way. And, and in a way, it becomes a, a very challenging award in that way. So. On behalf of J.D. Power, for a well-earned trophy, I want to congratulate you. Thanks, Chris, very much. Thank you. Good, good work. Hmm. Okay, back to work, ladies and gentlemen. meeting for the opportunity uh, for the public to comment on other items of district business. Please step to the mic. Give us your name, address. <coughs> there are many of you as a group, please appoint a spokesperson to do that. You know our new rules. Go ahead. Uh, I'm Nick Baird with the Energy Wind Development, and uh, we're the developer of the Prairie Breeze wind project that President Gates uh, mentioned and it's been a little while since I've been here and just wanted to stop in and say it's well underway. Turbine components are, are arriving on site, construction's on schedule, should be online uh, early next year and you know we appreciate the business and the relationship and look forward to bringing it online. That's really all I have. I, I have a question. Do yeah. you, uh, are you going to uh, have crop damage or are you going to wait till the Crop trial field, you really can't, can you? You're out there. No, so we work. Right the that's right. We work with the for the landowners, and, and they're paid for the Long for the damages. Yeah, so you, know, you could realistically wait. Till no, yeah. no. I was just curious. Yeah, no. That's a that's a daily thing on the on the construction site. We're trying to work with the landowners, but the landowners have been great. Great. So it's okay. going well. Can you just share with the audience exactly how large this wind farm is going to be, and what you think the capacity is going to be? Yeah, it's a so it's a uh, it's a 200 megawatt project which consists of 118 GE turbines. So they're rated at 1.7 megawatts. Um, so it's 118 turbines across Antelope and, and Boone counties. Um, the capacity factor is expected to be over 50 percent. Over 50 so, percent. Yeah. That's great yep. news. Yeah. yeah. So it's like 930,000 megawatt hours a year, kind of in that in that range. That's the expectation. Thanks for starting with mine. You bet. Appreciate it. I love to hear about wind. It's great. I'm Cynthia Tiedemann, um, 7562 Drexel Street, a customer and a retired nurse. Have a different story. Among all industrial sources of air pollution, none poses greater risk to human health than coal-fired power plants. The Clean Air Task Force commissioned comprehensive studies of health impacts caused by air pollution from U.S. coal-fired power plants. Each study incorporated the latest scientific findings concerning the link between air pollution and public health as well as up-to-date emission, emissions information. Both found that emissions from coal plants cause tens of thousands of premature deaths each year and hundreds of thousands of heart attacks, asthma attacks, emergency room visits, hospital emissions, and lost work days. 
As nurses, we bring this an invoice to Omaha Public Power District to show that the true cost of coal is not just our monthly bill, but it's our air, it's our water, and it's our bodies. Nurses' primary commitment is to their patients, whether it's an individual, a family, or a community. We promote, advocate for, and strive to protect the health, safety, and rights of our patients. Scientific, peer-reviewed medical research shows that coal pollution causes public health problems in our community. The American Nurses Association understands this. That's why they've joined other health care groups to support pursuing clean, renewable energy sources that allow us to stop burning coal in our communities. Coal contributes to four of the top five causes of mortality. This invoice that I have on the board and also that I'll give you a copy of represents the impact of coal in our community. The Clean Air Task Force came up with a number of health incidents from emission levels self-reported to the EPA by OPPD. Along with this bill is the abstract of the report describing how these figures were arrived at. And again, I'm saying to you, we need a concrete plan to close the North Omaha coal plant. Thank you, and you can leave your materials with the uh, corporate secretary, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Patricia Fuller. I'm from Council Bluffs. I'm also a retired nurse. Um, the two areas that I'm concerned about most, uh, the pollution that's created by coal-fired power plants, is mercury pollution and particulate matter, or soot. Coal-fired power plants are the largest emitters of mercury in the United States, emitting approximately 33 tons of mercury a year. According to the Centers of De Disease Control and Prevention, 8% of American women of childbearing years have unsafe levels of mercury in their blood, putting their newborns at risk for neurological defects. Mercury exposure at high levels can harm the brain, the heart, the kidneys, the lungs, and immune systems of people of all ages. When mercury is emitted from the, um, the stacks, it's taken up in the air and comes down as rain in our rivers and streams. There it's converted to its most lethal form, which is methylmercury, which is uh, taken up by fish and then humans consume that fish, where you get the high levels of mercury. In 2011, the EPA finalized their new, more stringent mercury rules, but OPPD, instead of committing to deal with the mercury problem, asked for and was granted an extension under the new MATS ruling. The second area we nurses are concerned about are the high rates of asthma in Omaha. A growing body of research links fine particulate matter, commonly known as soot, with increased rates of asthma, respiratory disease, heart disease, and premature death. The major sources of particulate matter is burning fossil fuels and solid waste disposal. Fine particles, or soot, are measured in size by their coarseness either as PM10 or PM2.5. Of the two, PM2.5 is by far the most dangerous because of its microscopic size. It's about the size of a human red blood cell. It can be breathed very deeply into the lungs, into the alveolar spaces, where it triggers asthma attacks. We are concerned about the high levels of uh, asthma in Omaha. Parts of Omaha have the highest rates in the country. I know you've heard this information before, but Omaha's asthma hospitalization rate is nearly double the national average. The highest average asthma rates in Douglas County are east of 42nd Street, and the highest number of asthma-related emergency room visits are in northeast Omaha. Thank you. Thank you.
Melissa B. is 2010 Grandview Avenue in Bellevue. Um, I'm a nurse at the Nebraska Medical Center. My goal is always to make people healthier. So I feel guilty every time I flip on a light switch, every time I turn on my air conditioner, because I know the uh, emissions from that coal-fired electricity is making people sick. The pollution from North Omaha's coal plant affects the health of local citizens and the carbon dioxide it emits affects global health by contributing to climate change. I'm not ready to give up on the health of our local citizens or that of our planet. So I'm calling on OPPD to make plans for shutting down the North Omaha coal plant sooner rather than later. Replace it instead with aggressive efforts in energy efficiency upgrades throughout our area and by taking advantage of Nebraska's vastly underutilized wind and solar resources. Thank you. Thank you. Anita Soto, um, 5002 South 19th Street. I'm a nurse on the labor and delivery unit, and I just wanted to briefly say that I, uh, it occurs to me that the babies I see born every day have quite a long life to live on this planet, and I, I will be very supportive of OPPD um, in their investments of renewables um, to, to protect the babies um, in, their, in their life on the planet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi. I am environmental artist Charlene Potter. I live at 4321 Laramore Avenue, Omaha, Nebraska, 68111. I was one of the participating artists in the OPPD Recycled Refrigerator Art Project a few years ago. I work in hand-built porcelain sculpture. Through the beauty of my water flower series, I demonstrate the importance of the relationship with our natural environment. I am not a scientist. I am here to present a different perspective. I see nature through artists' eyes. And I ask the question, when are we going to stop poisoning ourselves? I have lived a long time, and in the last 12 years, I have never seen anything like what we are experiencing today. Have you noticed the darkness with the storms we've had recently? I will share a poem and the darkness comes, and the darkness comes. The cold from the Arctic has left its ice, and it melts into a lake. The coldness of the Arctic is felt in the light breeze in July. A while, the dog nips at my heels in play. Small tree limbs dance on that breeze of cold, but they do not seem to notice the harshness. A, card a cardinal bird sings its beautiful song, while the earth's soil dries and cracks in drought, and the darkness comes, and the darkness comes. With the darkness, violent winds. The black walnut tree waits for the onslaught of the wind, and the darkness comes. The weeping willow waits for one drop of rain to quench her thirst, and the darkness comes, and the darkness comes. While the earth's soil dries and cracks in drought, and the darkness comes. So come along with me and look at nature through artist's eyes. It is a paradigm shift of thinking, moving from fossil fuels and nuclear power to the clean energy of solar and wind. It is the beginning of a new thinking process. It is an awakening of the mind to the importance of our natural environment. Our land, water, and air is more valuable than the most expensive Excuse me. Artwork ever created several times over. It is our heritage. As members of Planet Kind, it is our responsibility to make these changes. Our destiny depends on it. We need to learn to live a more sustainable life. Solar and wind is the hope energy of our future. All the new designs are inspiring. Jobs are being created. The price is coming down. This is history in the making. Thank you very much. Break it. Yeah, sure. Try not. 
not too. Uh, <laughs> okay. No, you're not. Laverne Train, 4728, guess. Um, uh, obeying all the state laws and, and the federal laws for the North Omaha plant is easy because no state consistently issues comprehensive toxic metal limits for all plants discharging ass scrubber waste in its jurisdiction. Out of the five um, permits that we reviewed in Nebraska, a limit for at least one pollutant, zero. You have zero across for arsenic, boron, cadmium, lead, mercury, and selenium, so you, you have no limits in which you can pollute. And then you do monitor the North Omaha plant. That is why we know that the plant emits more than 300 pounds of mercury each year. And of the 51 coal plants located in cities the size of Omaha or bigger, the North Omaha plant is the single biggest mercury emitter. <clears throat> That's why we know that information. So one problem you have is, is, an, is an environmental issue. And then the other problem you're having is, is economic issues. So um, out of a Bloomberg article here, we, um, uh, at the beginning of the month, uh, cost to run a reactor could climb by 5% annually through, through 2015, according to the February 19th research report of Credit Suisse Group. New carbon regulation for existing plants probably won't take effect until 2020, so the advantage of the new plant being clean doesn't really kick in until 2020. Um, and that was a New York analyst of USB Securities. And smaller, older, single unit facilities, I hope that sounds familiar because that is you, that sell power in competitive markets are the most vulnerable because they feel proportionally larger impact from rising maintenance and other expenses. <clears throat> and then, uh, I love this part of it, uh, Exelon's chief executive officer, Chris Crane, said in May that some of its nuclear generators in Illinois have to pay customers to take power about 8% of the time due to a glut of electricity provided by new wind turbine farms. Thank you, sir. Uh, nuclear, power, nuclear plants typically run around the clock and can't quickly shut down overnight when the wind blows harder and generates additional power that leads prices to drop to unprofitable le levels. So you've decided to spend a, a billion and a half since 2000 over the next 20 years on a nuclear power plant, which well, great, I should be behind it because you're going to start paying me to take its power. And, of course, Iowa just spent a billion to set up more wind turbines, which is going to exasperate that problem for you when you do get it online. So what I really want you to think about is non-performing assets. The nuclear power plant has been a non-performing asset for two years. Liquidating those non-performing assets, getting out of the generation of power, and begin more relationships like you have with this man. He's a private company. He's taking the risk of the generation. But what you have, which is glorious, is a marketplace, your Bloomberg marketplace. You have generators that want to sell power, and you have consumers that want to buy it. So if you thought of yourself more as a marketplace, putting data points throughout the entire grid, which is all smart grid really is when you made the mention about everything smarter, it's really about just having data points. He was talking about flying airplanes to look over the grid because that's the easiest way, but if you had data points deployed throughout the grid, small eyeballs, you could sit upstairs and look at monitors and see exactly what's going on before you deploy your resources. Then you wouldn't have to deploy more, or you wouldn't have to go search around looking for, you know, down power lines and that kind of thing. So it would save a lot of infrastructure costs. And it gets you out of the liability of generation. And because you're nonprofit, you can drive these prices very low. And of course, we know as renewable energy, as wind comes online at night, it gets cheaper. As the sun shines in the summer, it gets cheaper. So from a public utility that is a nonprofit that should be really working for me, I really want you to envision that as your new corporate model, if you have a possibility of doing that. Okay, there's that. And then I have a question. I know you can't really answer personnel questions, but I have to ask it. I'm sorry. Um, David Bannister, is he the vice president of Omaha Public Power District currently? Okay, well, I just wanted, it shows on LinkedIn that he's currently the vice president of o Omaha Power Public District, September 12th to present one year. And then it shows everybody else very accurate on the LinkedIn accounts. It shows all the other guys' stuff, and I just took a, a page of that. And I was just curious if we had a vice president in hiding or something no. that, you know, wasn't, you know, just curious about that. I just found that on LinkedIn, and, and it said it was up to date, and everybody else's account was up to date. And, um, and your comment about charging me seven cents during the day, well, tonight is tonight, and you should be paying me as soon as you open up this new plan, right? So, <clears throat> so anyway, that's, that's the concern I'm having, is these economics and the environmental, you can solve them by really thinking of yourself as a marketplace. Thank you.
David Corbin, 1002 North 39th Street. First of all, I'd like to congratulate you on your awards 13 years in a row. Uh, as you know, uh, I'm trying to bring forward uh, each time, if I don't have something new, I don't want to come up and talk, but I think I do have some things that perhaps uh, you have seen, but I want to make them a matter of record. Of course, you probably heard that Warren Buffett uh, said on July 22nd that coal will gradually decline in importance. As he, uh, despite the word gradually, he talked about, uh, obviously, you know, he has a $1.9 billion investment at Mid-America in Iowa uh, for wind and a huge solar in California. The, uh, I, on Sunday I went to on, in Lincoln on tour of the solar uh, arrays that they have there that are, are growing. Uh, the newest one is on a police station there, uh, something that I think we could emulate here. Uh, today uh, there's an article that says coal is at risk as global lenders stop financing. Uh, we know that that's happening. Here's another one that was in today's uh, Omaha World Herald. Solar power in the U.S. is becoming more popular, cost-saving option for homeowners. Uh, so, I like the, I, I don't know what the sample size was for J.D. Power, but I do know that the uh, Department of Sustainability Development in Omaha conducted a statistic, uh, uh, statistically significant sample survey, and in that survey, they showed that overwhelmingly that the uh, customers prefer solar and wind, overwhelmingly, and coal was way down at the bottom. So that's another uh, aspect that I hope, uh, because sometimes we're accused of being, we're the only people that come up here, nobody else cares, just a few of you that just are bugging us every month, and that uh, we've already given you uh, of surveys of uh, over a thousand people. So we do represent a lot of people. And then the, the study that just came out, and I believe you, if you haven't already, you've received a copy of the Closing the Floodgates, the uh, impact of coal on water. So with all of those, again, I hope, I know you're looking at it, I know you're looking at what to do with the North Omaha plant, but the sooner you close that down, the better. Thank you. Good evening. I am uh, Dr. Bobby Davis, uh, 4947 Spalding Street, and I am a 50-year rate payer for OPPD. Um, I just wanted to talk to the board a little bit about uh, some concerns that I have. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering why with the presentation of the material that you've had, um, why we don't see a more aggressive movement toward either a young man with a wind or someone with a solar. Uh, the health concerns in the community are very important to me, being a, a person who has one of those concerns. And I say, well, is it because you don't care about the people who live in the affected area? I say, well, no, that's not logical. Um, is it because um, you're elected, but you but you're not elected for people who live in that area, so you don't you're not really concerned about that. Uh, no, is it because you don't know? No, because you've been presented the material over and over and over again. So the question keeps coming to my mind: Why is it that this particular situation? And is it because you don't know how? No. As I told you several months ago, you have about 2,000 years of education between the board and the, and the staff. So I know that you can figure it out, and I know that you can figure it out how to do it economically. So the question keeps coming, why do we keep having this plant not moving toward one of your stated mission goals that you presented tonight? that is being environmentally sensitive, everything points to it going in that direction, but it's not going. So I ask you again to give this serious consideration and to begin. We know it can't happen tomorrow. We know it can't, we can't happen you know, next week, 
but we ask you to become seriously dedicated to moving in this direction. And I am concerned, I think at the last board meeting, you said there was a number of years of contract to buy coal. I don't, I don't know who that was one year or two years or three years of coal you already purchased. Um, and I don't remember what that, what that year was, but it seems like you're staying in that vein. So the question still remains, why are we stuck? And I hope that you will answer that for us very, very soon. Thank you. My name is uh, Doug Patterson, 2502 North 51st Avenue here in Omaha. I want to say a heads up to my former supervisor, Del Weber. <clears throat> um, glacial is a word for many decades. It was a compelling image of exceedingly slow, almost immeasurably slow change. I would describe, with all respect, <laughs> The pace of change of OPPD toward truly ecological process as glacial, except, of course, for the worldwide disappearance of glaciers because of fossil fuels. I trust the board takes pride in your contribution. Thank you. Hi, uh, Deshaun Cunningham, 604 South 22nd. Um, I know this isn't a question thing, but I wanted to submit a question, so I just wanted to give this to you. And I left my contact information, so I would like an answer back. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, Tom Foster, uh, 5215 North 6th Street. Uh, by my address, you can tell I'm real close to the uh, uh, power plant and uh, we're at I guess what you'd say ground zero and uh, a few years ago when I ran for office I had to collect signatures of people in my district uh, so I could run for office and so I went house to house in my neighborhood and uh, found an alarming uh, number of people on oxygen some of these people couldn't get out of bed to sign my petition but uh, when they heard that I was eager to get the Logiers Corporation to put afterburners on their paint ovens uh, to reduce the uh, emission of xylene, toline, benzene uh, into our heavily populated residential neighborhood, uh, they signed my petition and uh, eventually uh, the Logiers Corporation did install downstream afterburners which uh, burned up these uh, fumes into uh, non-lethal uh, emissions that quit causing harm. However, our other neighbor, OPPD, uh, has not done anything to reduce emissions. And uh, you're the number one emitter of mercury in the United States. How J.D. Powers can give me an award but you're the number one polluter in the country. It seems to me that the Powers, uh, J.D. Powers, needs to develop some new criteria for measuring the quality of a utility company's service. In a flat plain like a river valley, when emissions rise from the stacks, they eventually cool in the upper atmosphere and those pollutants fall to earth. River valleys are the most air temperature inversion prone pieces of geographic real estate in the world. And in the winter especially those emissions are trapped right in the bottom 8 to 10 feet of airspace. And it's killing people. It's killing your customers. And no smart business operator wants to kill off their customer base. But you're doing it, and you're doing it successfully. So, I and J.D. Powers congratulate you. Thank you very much. Kathleen Hughes, 36 Penfor Westgate Road. Um, I was at the last NRC meeting, and I just wondered if 
if you have addressed any of the issues that were brought up by the five out of seven people that came from the public. You know what I'm talking about? Like the ground, what's under the ground, and um, all the safety issues that were brought up at the meeting. Were you all there? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I represented both Fort Calhoun as the site vice president and the chief nuclear officer. And, and I can either take them one at a time. Um, I'll, I'll take some memory aid. I'll give you that because we, we obviously do quite a bit of discussions with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. With respect to the underground uh, soils work, right. uh, there's one inspection item that's left, and uh, we expect that to be uh, closed out or, or announced closed out very soon. And all of that information has been inspection ready and available to the NRC for several months. What about some other of those safety issues that were? Uh, the other issues that, uh, and, and again, feel free to remind me. Um, we typically get questions on what we're doing with beyond design basis flood protection. Uh, those procedures have been changed. The equipment has been procured. We expect the NRC to inspect that over the next couple of months. Uh, we continue to get questions on the bus fire that occurred in June of 2011. All of those corrective actions have been taken, not only specifically for the electrical system. But when we look at the processes that allowed that uh, that allowed that issue to get installed in the plant, uh, those have also been inspected. We expect to hear very soon, uh, starting with a debrief with the NRC tomorrow, that that inspection item is also closed. And we're working with the NRC right now on the, on the next series of public meetings, one down at the region where we're discussing our plan going forward, um, as well as the next public meeting in the September time frame up in Blair, which is uh, you know in the emergency planning zone. What about the projectiles from? Tornado projectiles, that was another discussion. Yeah, the tornado missile uh, protection, that was an uh, issue that we had identified. In, uh, we're going through a series of different modifications. As Mr. Gates mentioned, we have loaded fuel in the reactor, so we've protected the components that are necessary for us to load fuel. We're working on the next series of modifications and protection that will allow us to heat up the plant. Okay, well, a few things. Anybody have any questions about that? Um, and then uh, the spent fuel rods, how about, are they safe there? Are they going to be there forever? The spent fuel rods that are sitting on top of the... the yeah, so the like the remaining, or the, the other sites in the United States, we've got a combination of uh, storage in the spent fuel pool, uh, which we're taking additional measures to improve safety from the lessons learned from Fukushima. We do have an our license for dry fuel storage, and I believe actually in the news this week, as the, as the federal government, um, it, which is you know, ultimately responsible for taking a central repository that that Yucca Mountain project is, is back on the table uh, as that's gone through the court system. So right now we have, we have adequate storage facilities, you know, both on site and on the, on the wet side as well as the dry side. And uh, we'll continue to work with the industry uh, and with the federal government for that ultimate repository. And I just might add this isn't a question and answer session or is it a nuclear or Regulatory Commission meeting, so it's time for you to comment. That's it. That's my. Yeah. Seeing no one else at the microphone. Uh, Our meeting adjourned. Thank you very much. Jack and Matt, you're out. Jack and Matt, are you kidding? I good, man.